Yeah, I come from a, probably a different background that a lot of the people here um, work with developers that um, look at these properties as, like Jim said, no money is ever put into it from the, uh, no public money ever comes into it. The developer puts up the money. So um, my background is uh, started in civil engineering back in the dark ages. Um, it was just sewer water pre all the environmental regulations we live with now. And then for 10 years went with a general contractor. We did a lot of the earth moving like you see here. And then 10 years after that got into remediation, um, a lot of lead contaminated soil and that came in handy. And then from there progressed into the last two or three, four years in strictly brownfield development. Uh, so I look at it, um, the good thing about brownfield is when you start out, you're not the owner of the property. You, you get involved in the property if it works out. So the first thing you do is, uh, it's a real estate deal first. And you look at, like Jim said, uh, <coughs> is, it, is it a piece of property that you can de develop? And, and Palm Springs, um, where it was a landfill, it was also the, by traffic count, the busiest corner in Palm Springs. And it had Lowe's across the street and the city um, wanted a big box development to go in there, so that was, it was a perfect fit for that. It just it took uh, several developers tied it up and tried to figure out how to to deal with it, and then um, finally we came along and successfully developed it. Um, just some general comments before I start on on specific prog uh, projects. Um, one of the good things about uh, the brownfield uh, developments is the NIMBYs that you hear, not in my backyard. Um, every project that, that I've been involved in, the response from the public is extremely positive. We had to optimize the development of the property so that that landfill, which had a deed restriction on it in the center of the property, um, was in the best location to have the development around the outside of it. So there were like 50 iterations with an architect, with an engineer, with Home Depot, with Kohl's, trying to optimize the location of the cell. And every time we, if we shrunk the cell, you had the same amount of volume. You had to lower the cell to get the same amount of volume in the, in the landfill. Um, so. Entitlement's important. It, there's a balance of, of when you get involved in this. Um, there's a risk of the cleanup cost. There's a risk of the entitlement. Can you, and you have to do the same thing, the, same, the approval process at the same time. And they can take two or three or four years to get through that approval process. And so it's a, you know, which one's going to get to you? Do you spend the money for the cleanup and not, and not get the, uh, Entitlement, and you, but you have to have both work to, to have it succeed. Um, part of the team we put together is the environmental, like Jim has mentioned, the geotech, um, and then there's um, aesthetics. Um, done landfills where if there's a little odor to it, you know, you're not the developer's not going to be happy with it. Um, pieces of glass, things like that. Um, and then the key putting together a team is uh, to make it work, you, they all have to be confident. Everybody on the team has to be confident that for what they do. Jim's extremely confident in what he does and when Jim says it'll work that yeah, we can leave those, that uh, contaminated material in place you know, you get confidence from him, the geotech, the grading contractor that's not afraid to deal with this kind of material. And uh, so let me then go ahead and go to, in general on Palm Springs, uh, again, I guess the key thing was we had to design of the cell change like 50 times before we had uh, a plan that would work. Uh, one key thing that I found in all the landfills I've done, they all, I've done like six that have been on the Swiss list. 
but they're all pre-regulation landfills. They're uncontrolled landfills, like this was not official landfills. And the key to deciding if you can develop it or not is trying to get a feel for what's what really is the the representative type of material that you have out there. And a lot of times, uh, previous consultants will come out and they'll dig, dig 30 potholes, but really only two of the 30 have anything remarkable in them. The rest is dirt and not a problem. But a lot of the, a lot of the, so then they cover up the other 28 uh, potholes, and people tend to think the two that were the remarkable that have the heavy trash or the heavy odor or something like that becomes what they think is the representative of the landfill, and it's not. And in this case, like Jim said, by the time we moved the conglomerate, the aggregate of the material, um, I know from previous working with Caltrans, Caltrans will allow like 5% organics in a structural fill. Well, I, I'm guessing that this, the organics, by the time we moved 600,000 yards of material, the organics probably was 5%. And then again, it was deed restricted for just parking area in the center of the, of the property. Um, buildings weren't built on it. Bu buildings were built on the outside that had clean fill. The existing landfill was 3 to 23 feet, and but then we consolidated and the cell became like 45 feet deep. It's real easy to see the interface when you're out of the landfill and you're in the native, as opposed to um, a lot of remediation projects where if it's a VOC or if it's a um, lead that has leached into the soil, you can't really see where the interface is. But we, you can see immediately when you get out of, that, out of the, the landfill and into native. So it allows you to be extremely productive on moving in the dirt and you, you try not to move dirt more than once. City of Commerce, it was right in this area. There, there was a, a landfill that was 150,000 uh, cubic yards, consisted of debris from the Long Beach earthquake in 1920-something and rubber from a rubber processing plant. Notable thing on this was we had a newspaper of the 1920s that you could read that had an article on uh, Mulholland bringing water down and, and Mary Pickford and you could read this this whole newspaper <coughs> so the point of that is there wasn't a lot of degradation um, I think every landfill I've done has been that case but the lesson we learned on this was we tried to separate we took the this aggregate up and then we tried to separate it um, and by separating out the large pieces of rock the, the probably half inch pl uh, plus fraction, the half inch minus fraction, we actually um, created uh, lead contaminated soil that um, in situ, about a third of the soil failed the SDLC or TTLC for lead. When we brought it up, screened it, we kind of isolated, we, we concentrated that and actually had more failures because we did that. So I, I've avoided doing that since that because that was, that created a lot of cost. And the last project, uh, cemetery in uh, Palos Verdes, right in this area, adjacent to the cemetery, they, they had a rock quarry and for years took out rock and then for years they brought in uh, foundry sand there was lead contaminated. And here we consolidated the landfill in this area, a liner underneath it, then the, the contaminated material, another liner, and then eight feet of clean soil, and then the cemetery burial plots on top of that. Thank you.